Hello class, this is the lecture for 4-3 from the Forrester textbook, and I have an intriguing question for you that I would like to start things off with. Do you think you know how to spot a knot? Now, the, a K-N-O-T. Now, that, that may seem like pretty obvious, like you could look at a tangled pile of shoelace or rope or iPhone cord and say, well, that's, it's in a knot. And I would, I'm always surprised at how many times I pull at something, it doesn't come apart, and lo and behold, it's actually not a knot. It's just twisted and looped and looped, and if you just untuck it enough, as opposed to tucking through, untucking through a loop, that it's actually not a knot, that it's just a loop. And the idea that something can look complicated but actually not be is pretty universal throughout the world. So you can see here I've got a picture of uh, how to tie a fishing lure and this one is not tying. It's just a twist and it's not a knot. And that one, because it's got a little bit of tuck through a hole, is actually a knot and you couldn't undo that one with just rolling and rubbing. But it's, it's quite not apparent just to look at things that what is a knot and what isn't. So this then brings us to section 4-3 where we're talking about simplifying trig expressions. So probably ones without equal signs, without having anything in them that looks, uh, you know, that you could do something to both sides of the equation, but just an expression, just a single term, and then to find out it's actually way more simple than it appears. So here buried in the middle to keep you on your toes is your homework assignment that'll come up uh, that you need to bring to class is problems one and two from page 167. But our first example is sine theta times cotangent theta. Now you may think to yourself, this is pretty complicated looking. It's a complicated trig function. Cotangent has all these asymptotes and craziness and sine has all of these uh, very regular between negative one and one kind of wave to it. So this should be complicated. This is, this is a complicated thing. And if you put it in your calculator, I mean, if you put uh, y1 equals sine theta divided by tan theta, because there's no cotangent button, or I mean x, so sine x divided by tan x, you get this very, very plain looking graph that doesn't jump all around and have any asymptotes and act crazy. So why would that be? Why would that not be as complicated as it appears? Well, if you think about it the way that I just said, that way you would use to put it in your calculator, then this is sine theta times 1 over tan theta. And that looks pretty horrible. But there is another definition for cotangent. Not only is it 1 over tangent, but by the quotient property, it's also cosine over sine. And now you can see a term cancels. And in fact, this is all just stated most simply as cosine theta, which is what the graph looks like. It's up there at 1 and falling. This is a, cotan a cosine graph. So things can get a lot more simple than they first appear. Here is a, uh, a part where they've given you the beginning and then and the end, and you need to just show the steps to get from here to there. So cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta needs to turn into 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Hmm, how can we do that? Stroke your beard at home, too. Um, the question to ask yourself in this kind of scenario is to say, who's the bad guy? Who's the problem child? Who's the squeaky wheel? Who needs to get the oil? Who's, who's deserving of our attention? Well, if we look at what we're going for, we're trying to have 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. So sine squared is in the solution, is in the desired product, the desired outcome, and cosine squared isn't. So the cosine squared theta's got to go. It's the bad guy. It's the problem. It's the thing that needs to be dealt with. So then we say, well, how can we get rid of him? How can we get rid of this cosine squared theta? 
squared. Hmm. Do we know any trig identities that involve cosine or sine squared? The Pythagorean identity. Uh, yes, that cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. So just what is cos squared? Well, if we subtract sine squared from both sides, cos squared theta equals 1 minus sine squared. Mm, OK, so now we're trying to transform cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. So we said that the cosine was the problem and that we just found another definition of cos squared. So where cos squared was, I'll write 1 minus sine squared and keep that other one. And so I've got 1 minus sine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Well, if I, if I get confused, if you, all these letters and Greek and stuff is confusing, just remember, this is a thing, and this is that same thing. So if I have negative x minus x, then that's minus 2x. So if the same thing minus another one is minus 2 times that thing, and this is 1 minus 2 sine squared theta, which is what we were trying to achieve. So... I hope you're catching on here about the principles. On the, the previous slide here, we went for some other definitions of various trig functions. Uh, here, we use the identity to sort of substitute part of it away. What can we do here? What can be done with this one? Let me, this is the, the PowerPoint is a little bit sloppy there. One minus cos theta, all of that times one plus cos theta equals sine squared theta. So if you remember back to factoring, when you've got a minus b times a plus b, that's called a conjugate pair, and they multiply a, a minus b, I'm going to erase this in just a second, a minus b times a plus b always makes a squared minus b squared. Okay, I'm going to erase that. How does that help me here? I've got 1 minus cos theta times 1 plus cos theta. Something minus a second thing times something plus that second thing always makes the first one squared minus the second one squared. All right, well, 1 squared, that's silly. That's 1 times 1. So that's 1 minus cos squared. What is 1 minus cos squared? Hmm. All right, little aside here. We just did this. Cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. Now, if I move the cos squared to the other side, by subtraction, I get 1 minus cos squared theta equals sine squared theta. So this whole expression is equal to sine squared theta which is what we were trying to prove. Now, I know this word prove has maybe become a bit of a scary word for you since geometry. We're not going into the full geometric proof with naming the theorem every time and all that kind of stuff. What we just did with turn this into that, that's prove. That proofs are written with an equal sign, but you're not really allowed to touch the right side. Okay, so that sine squared theta over there on the right, we shouldn't do much with that. I mean, you could rewrite it as sine theta times sine theta or something trivial like that. But we're not going to multiply both sides of the equation by the same thing, all that kind of stuff. We're just manipulating the left side till it looks like the right side. That's what we're trying to do. Now here, this is where keeping all the different identities together in your mind is important, that this is complicated. There's lots of uh, parts to this. What is cotangent alpha plus tan alpha? Can we prove that that is equal to cosecant theta times secant of, theta, of alpha? All right, so this is kind of tricky here. The, the, the right side, I just said we're not supposed to touch the right side, but the right side is gross. The right side has those obscure trig functions that we don't use as much, cosecant in particular. So I'm going to permit myself one little bit, one little peek inside of the right side to just sort of say, what is cosecant? 
Well, cosecant is one over sine, one over sine of the angle, and secant is one over cosine of the angle. Okay, so I'm not going to touch the right side any more than that, but that was just kind of confusing to look at all those things. All right, and so now we've got stuff in terms of sine and cosine, so let's rewrite the left half in terms of sine and cosine. What is cotangent? Cotangent is cosine over sine, and tangent is sine over cosine. All right, so we're trying to prove that these are equal. Well, you know, the right side really is just one term. In mul in multiplication just smashes everything together, and it's just one thing. So the left side is two things. It's, it's something plus something. So why don't we bring that left side together and see what it is as one expression. Maybe that will help us. But these are fractions. And I can't add fractions, as a rule, unless they have a common denominator. So what is this first one missing? This first, so what, what is the, the LCD? What is the lowest common denominator? Well, it's sine alpha times cos alpha. So the, the left one is missing. So this, this existing, this is what was on the left. And I need to get it to be over sine cos. So I need to multiply top and bottom by cos alpha. OK. And then the right side over here, on the other side of the plus sign, that this was sine alpha cos alpha, but it doesn't have the common denominator equal. It's either. It's missing a sine alpha top and bottom. Sine alpha top and bottom. OK. So what does that now? Now we can start to bring this fraction together. Now we're going to have both pieces are going to be over the same common denominator. So what is cos alpha times cos alpha? That is cos squared alpha. And what is sine alpha times sine alpha? That is sine squared alpha. And all of this, we got them over the same denominator, cosine alpha, sine alpha. All right. So that right side is pretty simple, and the left side isn't. What are we going to do about that numerator? What is cos squared of an angle plus sine squared of an angle? <gasps> That's the Pythagorean trig identity. That's 1. That's 1 over cos alpha sine alpha. And if I just rewrite it with a different order, multiplication is commutative, then I get the same thing as the right side. Got it. Lastly, hardest thing of all is when we don't have any cool squares or stuff like that to help us out. There is one trick that is probably not on the tip of your tongue. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to you. Uh, but it's related to what we already did. We already saw that 1 minus cos times 1 plus cos turned into 1 minus cos squared. So when I look at this one here and I say 1 minus cos beta over sine beta, how can I prove that that is the same as sine beta over 1 plus cos beta? Well, I don't have any squares, so I can't use Pythagorean identities. None of these are these reciprocal weird trig functions, so that won't help me. This conjugate trick is the only thing that can help me here. This 1 minus b times uh, 1 plus b a, a minus b times a plus b turns into a squared minus b squared. That's the only thing that's going to get me out of this. So you just have to see that enough times. That's to say, if I multiply top and bottom by 1 plus cos, I haven't changed anything because I've multiplied top and bottom by the same thing, then, uh, then that, will, that will do something useful to the top. Another way to think about this is to say, this denominator over here has a 1 plus cos in it, and I've not got 1 plus cos beta anywhere. So if I multiply on the left uh, top and bottom by that, I haven't changed the fraction. Multiplying the same thing top and bottom is always cool. And then I've got one of the pieces that I'm going for. So hopefully some recombination will turn the top into sine. So let's go ahead and multiply out this numerator. We just did this. 
1 plus cos times 1 minus cos is 1 minus cos squared. And on the bottom, I'm not going to distribute. I see that I need to keep a 1 plus cos beta separate. So I'm not going to distribute that sine beta on the bottom. I'm going to leave this in two separate pieces so that I don't have to factor it out in a second. Now this, this numerator, we just did this also a second ago. What is 1 minus cos squared? It's sine squared. So I've got sine squared beta over 1 minus cos beta sine beta. And when you've got sine squared beta, that means sine beta times sine beta. One of the signs on top will cancel with the one sign on bottom. And I'll be left with sine beta over 1 minus cos beta. So I'm calling this the conjugate trick, where you multiply 1 plus cos times 1 minus cos, or 1 plus sine times 1 minus sine. That's the conjugate of it. Okay. So the tips for like proving these things. This is this is in many ways this is the hardest part for hardest lesson for some students of pre-calculus because you have seen math as this like step one, step two, bam, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Don't make me think. And this is getting now towards what math actually is. And math is actually experimentation with numbers and functions. And some of you are quite appalled to discover that. So this is, this is going to be hard for you to just experiment, to just fiddle, to just try different stuff. Break out of the mold. Try something new. Come on, loosen up. So some of the tip, trip, tips and tricks that I tried here was that when I saw one thing versus two things, I needed to bring the two things together. If they were one thing because of addition and this was two things because of addition, I found a common denominator and made it one versus one. Other tricks include factoring stuff out and then canceling it, the conjugate trick, uh, distributing stuff, the opposite of factoring, multiplying by what you want, getting everything in terms of sine and cosine. And the, the overarching principle that I like to think of here is where's the problem? Where's the part that's got to go? Who do I need to work on? Who do I need to change to be more like the right side? Who's the bad guy? Okay. So I hope this has been a helpful walkthrough of some basic introductions on proving trig identities. And we will do more of this in class. But please come prepared with the homework done and your notes taken on some of these different strategies. See you in class.